chapter 14 talks about the cost of capital. And in this chapter, we're gonna go through various measures to compute the cost of capital for the cost of equity, uh, the cost of preferred stock, as well as the cost of debt. So some of the things that we'll cover, uh, determine a firm's cost of equity capital, because again, a company has really three main sources to raise capital. They, they could issue equity, they could issue debt, and they could issue preferred stock as well. So we're gonna go through and determine the cost of equity, determine the cost of debt, as well as preferred stock. Uh, we're going to use those components to determine the, the firm's overall cost of capital and how we use that to come up with the valuation of the company. And then if a company decides to issue sh uh, shares or issue debt, sometimes they'll have to pay a commission to the underwriter. And that commission is often referred to as flotation. And flotation costs will eat into some of the proceeds that a company might receive when they issue uh, shares or the issued debt. And then we'll describe some of the drawbacks and pitfalls associated with the construction of, uh, construction of the firm's overall cost of capital and what to do about them. So why is a firm's cost of capital relevant? Um, we know that the return earned on assets that depends on the risk of those assets. Uh, the return to an investor is the same as the cost to the company. For example, if we went through and we can, uh, came up with a measure RE, RE again is the return on equity to the investor as 8%. Well, from the investor's perspective, the return is 8%. To the company's perspective, the cost is 8%. Okay, so as it says here in the second bullet point, the return to an investor, when you flip it around, it's the same as the cost to the company, okay? So if the required return is fairly high for the investor, that implies that the cost of capital to the company is also gonna be high. Again, the cost of capital provides us a snapshot or some type of indication of how the market views the riskiness of the company's overall assets. And then knowing the cost of capital can help us determine the required return for capital budgeting projects. Okay, the required rate of return is the same as the appropriate discount, and we use this to base the risk of the cash flows. We need to know the required return for an investment before we can actually go through and compute the NPV and then ultimately make a decision using the NPV whether or not we should take on the investment. And ultimately what we need to do when we make good decisions uh, as a company is that we need to at least earn the required rate of return to compensate our investors for the financing that they provided. Okay, so we'll start out with the cost of equity. The cost of equity is the return required by equity investors given the riskiness of the cash flows from the firm. And the riskiness can be broken out into business risk as well as financial risk. And we have two main uh, methods in terms of determining the cost of equity. We have the dividend growth model and we have the SML or the CAPM. And you guys have seen these before in your previous chapters. So to compute the cost of equity, RE, under the dividend growth model, we'll take D1 over P0 plus G. And again, that is the required rate of return for the investor, but on the flip side, it's also the cost of issuing equity from the company's perspective. Same thing for the cap M. It would be RF plus the difference between the return on the market less the risk-free rate times the company's beta. And again, this would tell us the required rate of return for the investor, but it would also tell us the cost of equity in terms of uh, to the company if they were to issue equity. So you guys have seen these before, so you know how to compute it, but now from the other perspective, this is the cost of issuing equity to the company. So let's go through a very simplistic example here. Suppose that your company is expected to pay a dividend of $1.50 per share next year, there has been a steady growth in dividends of 5.1% per year, and the market expects that to continue. The current price is 25 bucks. What is the cost of equity? So again, what approach are we gonna use here? Are we gonna use the dividend growth model, or are we going to use the cap M? Well, we can't necessarily use the cap M because they haven't given us any information regarding the risk-free rate, the return on the market, uh, or the company's beta. So we won't be using the cap M here. We will be using the dividend growth model. 
So in this case, D1 over P0 plus G. So in this case, let me hide that. It says right here that the company is expected to pay a dividend. So that lets you know that we have D1. So we'll plug in a dollar fifty here. P0 refers to the current share price of 25. And then the growth rate is 5.1%, so 0 0.051 as a decimal. And when it's all said and done, this should come out to 0.111 or 11.1%. Okay, so let's interpret this number. From an investor's perspective, if you're investing in this company, based on these assumptions and the numbers that we have, the investor requires a return of 11.1%. On the flip side, if the company is going to issue new equity, the cost of issuing that new equity is 11.1%. So from the company's perspective, or company's viewpoint, an investor's viewpoint, An investor wants a large required rate of return. You know, if they're going to take on additional risk, they're going to require a very large required rate of return. So a larger R is better for the investor. From the company's viewpoint, they want to keep the required rate of return as low as possible because that's a cost to them in terms of issuing equity or raising capital. So they want R to be as low as possible. All right. Now, Let's go back to the main slide deck. So this is precisely what we're doing here, and that's what we did in the previous example. The cost of raising equity using the dividend growth model, DGM, is D1 over P0 plus G. And again, you could also use the cap M, but again, you'd have to be given the inputs associated with the company's beta, the risk-free rate, and the return on the market. Okay, on the next video, we will pick up on section three.